You know, uh, it's been a few years since I've been on the San Jose campus on a Sunday morning. And I just got to let, I like what I'm seeing. God's doing something special and powerful here. You know, I get like a, a preview as I get to sit around a Tuesday table with Pastor Tom and hear his heart and vision. Aren't you thankful for Pastor Tom and Robin, our new lead pastors here at Bethel? And as we begin to hear what God's speaking to him, to us as a team, you know, one thing I can tell you confidently is I want to hope you're thanking God for your pastor. I hope you're praying for him. But there's something resonating from as I hear them is Bethel's destiny is greater than our history. The things that God has ahead of us, it's going to greatly affect and impact our community. And we all got to be in this thing together. We, need to all, we just need to all go all in and say, man, I'm into this, God. I, I'll do whatever you call. And as I, as I begin to, as, as, you, as he started to preach through this series of fundamentals and he's going through the core purposes of who we are as a church, my heart is leaping inside because if a church can look like that, just watch out Silicon Valley, Bay Area. You don't know what's coming at you. Something great. God is up to something big. And we just get, to, aren't you thankful that we get to be a part of it? And, and uh, you know, it's interesting, I was listening, I was watching a Warriors game. Any Warriors fans out there? Warriors fans? Okay, there's a little more in the first crowd, so we need to step it up. You need to learn what winning is like and watch a Warriors game for any of you Lakers fans out there. And so, you know, and, uh, I was watching this Warriors game, and they went up, and it's amazing basketball, and, and, and this shot comes up, and it's amazing. The crowd's going wild, and then all of a sudden, like, the, you, the, like the, you hear the whistle, whistle blowing, and the ref's like doing this, which means the shot didn't count, and it was, a, it was a foul and a traveling call on the guy that made the shot. You know, a traveling call is they took one too many steps. But the interesting thing is the commentator said this says, uh, there's a problem I'm seeing, the commentator said. He says, these professional basketball players, I see it in college basketball, is they don't know the fundamentals anymore. They don't know the fundamentals anymore. And, and it really struck me because an NBA professional, he'd been an NBA professional for 10 years. That means he's one of the best in the world at basketball. But even you could get so good that you forget about the fundamentals. Do you know that challenge me is, one, we all need to know the fundamentals of what it means to be a Christian. If we want to excel in life, we all need to be good at the fundamentals. Is that right? But also, not only that does that tell me is no matter how far along we get, we need to all be reminded of the fundamentals. The core purposes of our life. And, and, and Pastor Tom went through these six purposes of what it means to be a believer, the fundamental, what we are all called to live out. Some people can say, well, I'm, I'm good at two of those. But I want you to know that's, we're called to excel at all these. One, he said, was worship. Another, he would say, was discipleship. He said, stewardship, discipleship. We should all be growing. I hope you're growing in your faith, that you're farther along in your faith today this Sunday than you were last Sunday, than you were last year. Stewardship, that we're taking care of our times, our talents, and our treasures. We're taking care of them and managing well. That our fellowship, we're engaging in relationship with other believers. That ministry, I hope you found a place to serve here at Bethel, to serve in ministry right here and in your community, and evangelism to reach the lost. We're all called to excel in all of these, but there's one I want to focus on today evangelism. Now Jesus said some interesting words. These were some of his last words before he would ascend to heaven. Now when someone is on their deathbed or they know their time is coming short, they pick their words wisely. Their words count. These words are really already important because they're in the red letters in your Bible. Just so you know, that means Jesus said them. These are powerful words. But the timing of these words adds even greater emphasis because these are some of the last words he would ever say to his disciples. So he's picking them well. He's picking them on purpose. And he said this in Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. How many? All. So we want to... 
all, we want to have a vision to reach our entire community. We can reach the nations right here. If we would affect San Jose, you know we can reach the nations from right here. A multicultural, international city. We, therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples. We should have, be seeing new people coming and getting saved, discipled, growing. That should be part of the rhythm of our week. New disciples to obey all the commands I've given you. Now, we as a church, as a corporate church in America, we can fall into a, a mistake that we can start to think that this great commission was a corporate mission of the church and that if the church has seen big numbers get saved, that we're doing okay. But do you know that this isn't just a corporate mission, but our personal mission? That each of us here today in Bethel, that each of us, this is our mission to go make disciples. You should be making disciples in your life. Now, what does it mean if you're, help, if you're making disciples? Well, discipleship involves four things that you're gonna help people excel in. The first is to know Jesus. How many here have experienced forgiveness of Jesus? Mercy, anybody experienced mercy? Healing, provision. Isn't Jesus too good to keep for ourselves? We gotta pass him along. We gotta help people know Jesus. The second is part of the discipleship process is for people to find freedom and healing in their life. We, we want them to find the freedom that only Jesus could bring. The, the third one is to discover their purpose. Why are they on this planet? Each of you have a unique purpose. Each person on this planet, God put here for a specific purpose. And we wanna help people find that purpose out, to live it out. And the fourth is to make a difference. These are the four stages of discipleship. Now, if you look at these four, Know Jesus, find freedom, discover a purpose, make a difference. The last three can't happen without the first one. Jesus makes the last three possible. We have got to help people know Jesus. Evangelism is the first part of that process to help people know Jesus. Now, we all love the sound. We like to hear about people getting saved. Anybody love hearing stories of transformation? I know I do. I love it when I hear people accept Christ. Just a couple of weeks ago at AMP in a youth event, we had hundreds of teenagers show up. At the end of the service, my wife's giving the altar call. If you've never seen my wife preach, oh, you got to come here. She's amazing. She's giving the altar call, and she asked people who wants to know Jesus, 50 hands go up. Just She didn't even have to wait. They were just like, man, I want Jesus. Brand new salvations. That's awesome to hear. Now, we love to hear stories about people sharing their faith, inviting people to church, but is it a whole nother thing to say, to have the courage for me to do that? Like, I love to hear the stories of others, but now you're asking me to do it? Oh, that's a whole nother story, right? This requires courage to share my story, to invite someone else to church, to bring them to a service. Courage is a powerful thing. We all like the power that courage gives us. Courage, though, is not the absence of fear. It's stepping out in the face of it. Courage is like, it's, it's a power grab. It, it allows the what-ifs to grab power and seize that power from your life. It's time. God wants you to be filled with courage to share. He says, I'll give you power, Acts 1-8, to be my witnesses. You are called. We are all called to be witnesses. And God wants to give us the courage to do that. Now, one thing I would say is I want to train up my kids. I have an 8-year-old son, Isaiah, and a 4-year-old daughter, Micaiah. And I want to train them to be fearless risk takers. I don't want them to be controlled by fear. Any other, you want to raise your kids to be fearless, to take risks, to live their dreams? Anybody else? I only got three. And okay, I was just checking. I was speaking to the right people here. And I, I want to, and I will tell you this as a parent, I want to help them face their fears. And, and there's something I buy into completely. I believe I'll even bribe them to help them face their fears. Now, my son has a fear, a tremendous fear. I think he has nightmares about it. It's like his kryptonite, his Goliath. It's called Brussels sprouts. <laughs> and uh, he hates Brussels sprouts. And, uh, and one, one day, I'm, I'm like, man, I want to help, uh, I, I help him eat and enjoy one of these weird-looking vegetables. And so we're, we're down, we're sitting down at a restaurant for pizza with some friends. And... Uh, 
And they set a bowl of Brussels sprouts on the table. And you know what he's thinking? He's like, someone planted, what, what, I, I thought I was here for pizza. Like, he thinks that's the greatest food ever created in the history of mankind. And you give me Brussels sprouts. And so I'm like, hey, Zaya, you want a Brussels sprout? He's like, no. I'm like, you sure? It's going to be really good, no? I'm like, Here, here's what I'll do. Is I pull out my wallet. I set a dollar on the, on the table. One dollar for one Brussels sprout. He's like, no. I'm like, I set another dollar. Because two dollars is a lot of money in my life. He's like, nope. So I up the, I up the ante. I put three more to reach five dollars. He's like, uh, n- no. So my friend Brian's with me, and he sets, he matches. He says, okay, I'll add another five. I'll make it ten. And Isaiah's eyes get big, and he's like, really? <laughs> it's amazing, a matter of perspective, what he saw, the worth of, five, of $10 in his pocket was a lot more value than a bad taste in his mouth. I remember one of his greatest fears, Brussels sprouts was bad, but this one takes it to a whole other level. My son's fear of haircuts. Oh, man, it was like the once-a-month nightmare in my life, in our house. Now, my son is getting big. He's eight years old, and I went to, we went to youth camp, winter camp recently, and he was taller than almost all the junior hires, eight years old. So what we used to have to do, literally, I would grab, I would hold his arms and wrap my legs around his legs to hold him still so Lynn could cut his hair. It was the worst. He would cry. He would scream. He would try to injure me. He would do whatever it took to get out of a haircut. No threat. Nothing would ever solve the problem. So one day we're sitting at the table and we're like, this shall end. We're done with this. Somebody else has to give a haircut. So we decide. I'm like, $5 for a haircut, Isaiah. I'll give you $5 to go get a haircut. He's like, nope. $10, nope. $20, nuh-uh. I'm like, man, what is this going to take? So my wife decides to up the ante. She's like, I'll give you, I'll buy you a pair of Curry 2.5s. That's a pair of really nice shoes for some of you that don't know. And he's like, really? And she didn't ask me about this. I was like, really? (laughs) And then I'm like, yeah, yeah, Curry 2.5s. And he's like, Okay, I'll do it. I like got out my phone. I'm calling, like, please, make an appointment right now. Let's do this right now. It's amazing what perspective will do. It's a powerful thing. Your perspective can change everything. The, the worth of 10 bills in his pocket was more valuable than a bad taste in his mouth. The value of a pair of shoes he saw as more valuable than scissors touching his golden locks. It's all a matter of perspective, courage. It's the power to face your fears. Power is fueled by your perspective, by how you see. It has been said that sight equals might. It's a matter of perspective. See, your perspective fuels your power. You see this across the Bible. Matthew's telling the story of when Jesus wanted to get alone. And so he's traveling to be alone, and then he... And then in verse, in Matthew chapter 14, verse 14, this happens. Jesus gets interrupted by a crowd. But it says this, Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat. And he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Do you know what it started with is Jesus saw. Jesus saw. This, what would then happen is these people, after healing the sick, they were out in the wilderness in the desert so long, he, they're getting hungry, so he then performs a, performs a food miracle where he feeds 5,000 people from five loaves and two fishes. What moved Jesus to act, to throw his schedule out the door, was the fact is that he saw people. He saw them. All right, I think about the story of Nehemiah a few hundred years before that, and Nehemiah was going to his business as usual, and someone starts to tell him what his city, Jerusalem, he'd been brought into captivity. He's working for a, 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 an evil empire, but he hears how Jerusalem is, that they're broken down, people are beaten up, they're getting taken captive, and his heart's broken because he began to see them in his head, and he says, I have to do something that he saw, and so it gave him courage to act, and so he would risk his life and go before the king and get a foreign king to help him rescue his own people. Or I think about Paul, the apostle Paul, when he rolled into Athens, one of the most perverse cities. 
in the first century, in Acts 17, verse 16, this is what Paul says, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply troubled by all the idols he saw everywhere in the city. See, idolatry, whatever you worship, has power over you. And so his heart was burdened by the bondage of people, and he's broken. He had to do something about it because he saw them. So he had the courage to speak out and share the gospel. Perspective fuels your power. Sight equals might. See, when you see, you'll act. It's time that we open our eyes. But the question we have to ask ourselves is, what frames your perspective? What determines what we see? People can grow up in the same city, the same neighborhood, the same family, but they can see two different things. They, the difference is, is their perspective. The truth is, is that your perspective must be framed by your purpose. Let me say it this way. What you live for should frame what you look at. What you focus on I, I, gets bigger. I remember when I bought a Blue Highlander, and I thought I was the first person in California to ever own a Blue Highlander when I bought it. And then I drive off the parking lot, and I'm seeing them everywhere. Anybody else have that problem? Because all of a sudden now you're looking for it. It's interesting how your perspective changes. I was driving by Blue Highlanders all the time, but now I was looking for them, and so I saw them. Whatever you focus on gets bigger. It's time that we would pre-decide our, our focus to predetermine your frame. What are you focusing on in your life? What are you looking at? If my power is fueled by my perspective, then I need to decide what I'm going to be looking at. Our purpose must frame our perspective. Or you could say it this way, your purpose frames your perspective, which fuels your power. Do you want the courage to witness? I know I do. The power to witness? Pray that God would help change your perspective, what you're looking at. And one of our fundamental purposes for living, each of us, is to go make disciples. To help people know Jesus. We are all called to live that out. So this must frame our perspective, that everything we look at is through the lens of evangelism, where I'm going, who I'm talking to, what I'm doing, who I'm spending time with, what I'm talking to them about. It must come through the lens of evangelism. How is today, how is what I'm doing, how is where I'm going help people know Jesus? Because sight equals might. Your strength, your courage comes from what you see. And when you see people through the lens of evangelism, when you start deciding who's in your frame, what happens is you start thinking about people's eternity. You know what I'm talking about? Thinking about heaven and hell. And pausing to think a moment is like, how is their soul doing? Where are they spending eternity? Where's my coworker spending eternity? Where's my kids? Where's, where's my parents? Where's my neighbors? And you start looking through this lens. Because the truth is, if we love people, won't we care about their eternity? It got really quiet in here. If we really love them, aren't we going to care about where they're going to spend forever? Because the truth is, the fuel for courage is a love for people. If you'll love them, you'll speak to them. See, we don't have a courage problem in the church. We have a love problem. If we would really love people, we won't have any problem telling them about Jesus. See, it's time to get some love that would consume our hearts with people, that would break us. Do we really see the lost? Do we see people? Jesus saw the crowd, and it caused them to act in compassion. Because we, let's be honest, we can walk past them in the coffee joint. We, we, we can work with them every day. We can wave at them on the streets. But do we really see them? We must decide that our purpose will frame our perspective, that my reason for living, what I live for, will determine what I look at. You would be surprised at what you could do if you would focus. See, you need to control your frame because you can't control what's happening around you, but you can control your frame, what you focus on. Now, 
I, I remember getting ready for a video shoot one day, and I'm standing in front of the camera, and the camera guy says this, he says, hold on, I need to frame the shot. And in that moment, what he was doing is he was deciding what needs to be in the frame and what shouldn't be. He's deciding what needs to be focused on and what needs to be blurry. The camera people, aren't you thankful for our camera people each Sunday showing up early to make sure that you could get a better perspective? That I just talked to somebody that right now is on a business trip in Texas this weekend. He's, he says, I'm going to log in on YouTube. I'm going to watch the sermon. I'm thankful that they're making it possible that people are ministered to around the world. But these camera people, they decide each time they grab a hold of that camera what needs to be in the shot. And now I want, I want to illustrate this for you to help you understand what's in your frame. So I want you to zoom in as close to me as you can. Now, I'm sure that all of you are thankful that they never zoom in this close to me normally. So you don't see that definition in my face. That is not a good thing. We want people to want to come to church. So you could zoom back out. Now, this is the power, the power of focus. See, but a lot of people are living their life like this. I want you to put that, that shot there, that wide zoom shot. A lot of people are, are, can you turn the house lights up so they can all see their beautiful faces? A lot of people are living their life like this. Is Everybody turn to that. Can't wait, why don't you wave at them? Wait, wave at the camera. right over. There's a camera. Some of you like never knew there was a camera over there. There is a camera over there. Look at, see, you're all waving at the camera. Do you know that a lot of people are living their life like this? The problem with living your life in wide zoom focus is you're allowing whoever to come into your shot and to do whatever they want. And it's determining the future of your life. Your boss can come in and say a negative word to you and it ruins your week, your life. You can have a problem in your finances, your life is, you feel like your life is over. You're allowing other people to determine your perspective. See, but what we need, to, I'm gonna use Pastor Ryan. Pastor Ryan, why don't you come in and help me? So this is Pastor Ryan. Helps lead our starting point, connect all the new people in our church. I really appreciate everything that he does. If you have a new friend or family, he's going to help take care of them. Don't you appreciate that to help them find a place to belong here? So this is Pastor Ryan. Now, the illustration I want to do is you can see both of us, Pastor Ryan, that you just elevated the quality of our shot when you stepped in. Thank you so much. And so now the, the, uh, the, this is how people are like, who, life is determining what's going to come in and out of your life. But I want you to decide to pre-decide your focus. Now just watch this. See, instead, what I want is I want you to camera focus on me to pre-decide your frame. And to say, I don't care what life throws at me, I don't care what hardship, what people come, try to come into my life, I'm predetermining my focus and what I'm gonna look on. I'm deciding that my purpose is to seek and save the lost, to help make disciples, so it doesn't matter how, how, what hardships the devil throws at me, what life throws at me, what my family says about me, what my friends say, it doesn't matter, because I know my purpose, and my purpose is to make disciples. So when I wake up in the morning, I'm, I've decided what's in my frame. I've decided what I'm gonna keep my focus on. Thank you, Pastor Ryan. Now, some of you are like, see, the truth is, the problem is of allowing whoever and whenever to decide who's in your life, if you don't decide who you're going to focus on, when you allow things in your frame that shouldn't be there, it weakens your focus, which saps your strength. Because your pers perspective determines, it fuels your power. Now, think about a mom a mom, think about how moms can act, the strength they can have when their children are in danger. You've heard those stories of women jumping, moms jumping into raging waters, lifting their child to safety, or like a mom literally picking up a car to rescue a child that's trapped underneath. You know what I'm talking about? See, what the reason that happens is because that mom understood her purpose, which is to care and protect that child. And so her frame, she predecided that this child is going to be in my frame. It doesn't matter what is happening around me. It doesn't matter what river is raging, what disaster could happen to me. I don't care. My child is in danger. And that focus gave her strength, courage. If helping people know Jesus is our purpose, we need to keep lost people in our frame. 
If you frame your perspective to seek and save the lost, you know what? You're going to anticipate them. You're going to start looking for them. When they come, instead of being sad when your Christian neighbor moves away, you're just excited because someone's going to move in that needs Jesus. When you get moved, your company moves you to another floor, another business somewhere, instead of getting bitter, you look at it as a new opportunity to, for your faith to be shared. You want to start a life group that could reach your new floor for Jesus. What would your week be like if you framed it up before you entered it? Your frame determines what you anticipate, what you look for, and what motivates you, what gets you going. Your frame determines what you look forward to. Your, your perspective determines what makes you happy and what makes you sad. Because your purpose frames your perspective, which fuels your power. Think about what Hebrews says this. It says, who for the joy, Hebrews 12 two, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. He's talking about Jesus. Do you know what he decided? He says, I'm not going to look at the cross, the suffering, the beatings, the betrayal, the accusations. You know what I'm going to look at? I'm going to look at you. The joy set before him was you in heaven with him. And that because you were in his frame, he was to able to endure the worst suffering imaginable. What if we decided that people would be in our frame? The people that need to know Jesus were in our frame. Now, Philip is a, is a man in the New Testament in Acts that gives us a great example of someone that lives this out. And Acts 8 tells a story. And we're going to jump down this chapter here because I want you to illustrate what we just learned about perspective and, and purpose. You'll actually see this lived out in Acts chapter 8, verse 1. A great wave of persecution began that day, sweeping over the church in Jerusalem, and all the believers except the apostles were scattered through the regions of Judea and Samaria. So persecution is unleashed on the church, but I want you to see that persecution didn't determine their perspective. They understood their purpose. How do I know that? Well, look in verse 4. But the believers who were scattered preached the good news about Jesus wherever they went. Wow. See, uh, then look at what it, uh, the story then decides to take a focus, an example in Philip. In verse 5 it says, Philip, for example, went to the city of Samaria and told the people there about the Messiah. It says, persecution. I want you to look at this. Persecution drove him from Jerusalem, but his purpose never changed. So he started evangelizing Samaria, and it's going well. The city's experiencing revival. Even the apostles from Jerusalem had to come see what's happening. But the great thing about it is the story doesn't stop there. Philip goes on to do more ministry because I want you to see something that success didn't cause him to settle. Success doesn't have to cause you to settle. 2016 may have been a good year for you. God may have done some great stories in your family, in your life, in your business. That you're at a mountaintop, but I don't want you to build a building, a, a luxury escape and say, I'm going to live here the rest of my life so I can just tell stories about my past. You know that God has new mountaintops waiting for you. God has new destinies that he's planned for you, great plans to prosper you and not to harm you. He wants to do great things for you in the future because your destiny is greater than your history. Right it's time to start walking and believing like that. And this is Philip, and he's like, I can't stop here. This is too good to stop. This is too good to keep to myself. So in verse 26, about 20 verses later, it continues. And as for Philip... An angel of the Lord said to him, now I want you to listen to what God said. It says, go south down the desert road that runs from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out and met a treasure of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, under the candake, the queen of Ethiopia. And the Holy Spirit said to Philip, go over and walk along beside the carriage. Now notice what God said. He says, go walking. Notice what God didn't say, go talking. So God said, go walking. He didn't say go talking. Do you know why? Because talking is a given. There's some things you will never have to pray about. Oh, come on, Pastor Matt. You're going to tell me I don't have to pray about something? Yes. One of those things you will never have to pray about is should I tell that person about Jesus? That is something I will never, should I go witness? 
Should I go make disciples? That is something I, so Paul, God didn't have to tell Philip, Philip, go tell that person about me. That was already something that Philip knew was a purpose of his. So when he went walking, the talking was a given. Now look at about this story that's amazing. Is look at who Philip would minister to, this Ethiopian eunuch. It's a person of a different race, a different culture, a different class. He owned his own carriage. He was a in a, living in a palace, someone in a different position of power in their country. And who's Philip? A common Jew. But Philip wouldn't allow the differences to stop him because all he could see was a man, a man that needed to know Jesus. That's all that mattered in his frame. In verse 30, Philip runs over and here's the man reading from Isaiah. And Philip asks him, do you understand what you're reading? He's like, how can I unless someone tells me? And Philip, like, that's my chance. And begins to share to him about the Messiah, about Jesus. Do you know if you show an interest, they'll give the invitation? And that's what Philip did is he showed the interest, and the man invited him in. And then the man literally in a moment stopped the carriage. He says, hold up. I like what you're talking about, Jesus. I want to believe. Let's get baptized right here. You see that lake right over there? Man, that kind of faith response it's time to reframe our perspective to decide what's in our frame. I have an opportunity to minister to people laying in hospital beds that have been given a short amount of time left in their life. And I've seen something happen in each of these moments. They make a decision to live differently. Have you ever seen some people that are about to die actually start living? Do you know why? Is their frame changed? What they decided to focus on changed. They decided on purpose what would be the focus of their life. Don't let it take a tragedy for you to fix your frame. Don't, don't let it take a funeral for you to value your friends. Become a framer in everyday life because your purpose frames your perspective, which fuels your power. I want to call, talk about something that's called the Deborah effect. Not Deborah from the Bible, but her name is Deborah Graham, and she's on Santa Clara campus right now. I'm really proud of Deborah because she's lived this principle out. And Deborah every day would walk in from her car and walk down a path and pass some doorways on in, and one of those doorways held a girl named Cassie, and Cassie didn't know Jesus. It was without hope and a future in her life. But Deborah saw and invited her to church, administered to her, and Cassie accepted Jesus. Not only that, she sensed a call to God in her life, and right now, today, as we speak, she's leading worship on the Santa Clara campus, Cassie is today. And then Cassie would see this and invite a friend of hers named Evelyn. Evelyn now is in the school of leadership. She had ex now would accept the Lord, get in the school of leadership, is called to be a minister. It's going to be a missionary and travel the world. And Evelyn would then minister to her sister Cindy, who would minister to two girls, Perez girls. And literally now we can trace 25, 20 to 25 names back to Deborah Graham. That's the power of perspective. What's in your frame? You know, I want to thank a, a young girl in high school. Her name was Gabriella. And Gabrielle went to class and sat by another girl every day. And I want to thank Gabrielle because I would not have the family I have today if not for Gabrielle. I wouldn't have my two kids, beautiful kids. I probably wouldn't even be here in Bethel if not for Gabrielle because Gabrielle noticed a girl sitting next to her that didn't know Jesus. She focused on her frame. And she saw a girl next to her, and her name was Lynn, and invited Lynn to come to a drama that would share about heaven and hell so she could learn about Jesus. And they invited, Gabrielle invited Lynn to come to the drama with her. And they got the drama two hours earlier because the seats were packed. There wouldn't be no seats left. So they got there early to make sure Lynn could have a seat. 
I'm thankful for Gabrielle because my wife, Lynn, got saved that night, walked down to an altar because Gabrielle decided who was in her frame. What if we could fix our frame like that? What if we could decide in the morning who would be in our focus? We need to frame our focus to decide what's going to be in our frame because people matter. Why don't you stand to your seats with me? I'm going to ask you to do something cheesy because that's just kind of what I am. So you'll have to forgive me for a moment. But if all of you could just take a moment and put your hands together like this in, in front of you. Some of you in newer church are like, this church is weird. What are they doing to me? Just, just hold on for a minute, minute because I'm talking about the power of your perspective. What if we decided in the morning, I'm not asking you tomorrow morning when you wake up to put your hands like this. Now, if you need to, you can do whatever you want in the comfort of your own home. But what if we in the morning decided, God, I'm gonna, make lo I'm gonna put lost people in my focus today. How can today I help someone know Jesus? What if we were that determined that we pre-decided our frame. You can put your hands down. Why don't you all bow your heads and close your eyes with me? I've been talking about all service about knowing Jesus. You, heard, you saw many people raise their hands because they've experienced forgiveness and freedom. There are marriages here today that are together only because of what Jesus did in their marriage because they would have been divorced. We have some in this church, they were suicidal, and they would not be alive today if not for Jesus. You know why we want people to know Jesus? Because he is the answer to every one of life's problems, and ultimately, he's the only way into heaven. Yeah. So if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, I want to give you an opportunity to know him right now. If you're far from God, you'd say, Pastor Matt, maybe when I was little, I, I, I believed in Jesus, but if I was to be honest, today I'm not even sure if I'm right with God, but I want to recommit my life to Christ. Or maybe you're here for the first time, you're saying, I want to commit my life to Christ for the first time. I want to give you the opportunity, I would like the honor to introduce you to a Savior named Jesus who loves you. If you're here today, no one looking around, you just give them privacy for a moment. If you're here today and say, you know what, I need to get my life right with God, I want to choose to follow Him. Just lift up your hand and wave it at me. Just lift it up. If you're here today and you need to start a relationship with Jesus, just wave it at me. Just wave it at me. I'm seeing some hands in the balcony on the floor. Just wave it up. Lift it up at me one more time. Okay. Do you know the great thing is, do you know every Sunday it should be in the rhythm of our church that people are coming to Christ? And you know what's going to make that happen if we decide to frame our focus? So if with everybody's head bowed, I'm going to pray a prayer. I want you to repeat it after me if you raise your hand. But if you're here today and you've already prayed a prayer, you're right with God. I want you to pray it with them because I want them to know they're joining a family, that we're going to walk through life with them. So let's pray this together. Say, Lord Jesus, I come to you today because I need forgiveness. Please forgive me of all my sins. Come be the Lord of my life. I choose to believe in you. I choose to follow you, and I declare you today as my Lord and Savior. I believe you died and rose again, and I will live for you for the rest of my life in Jesus' name.